Welcome to Dwell in the Word. Today is January 20th. It is Friday. Therefore, we are in piercing heaven for another prayer. Let us pray. There was no sorrow like your sorrow, Lord, no love like your love. Was it not enough, dearest Savior, that you came down to pray and sigh and weep for us? Would you also bleed and die for us? Was it not enough that you were hated, slandered, blasphemed, and buffeted, but you would also be scourged, nailed, wounded, and crucified? Was it not enough to feel the cruelty of man? Would you also experience the wrath of God? And if your love was not enough, giving up your life and shedding that precious blood, was it not enough to die once, to suffer one death? Would you die twice by tasting the first and something of the second death, suffering the pains of death in both soul and body? Oh, the far surpassing love of Christ. Heaven and earth are astonished at it. What tongue can express it? What heart can conceive it? The tongues and the thoughts of people and angels are far below it. Oh, the height and depth and breadth and length of the love of Christ. All creation knows not how to react. Our thoughts are swallowed up. And there they remain until glory elevates them, when our job will be to praise, admire, and adore this love of Christ. Amen. All right, we're finishing up Isaiah chapter 44 today. We're going to read verse 21 through, it looks like, verse 28. Hear the word of the Lord. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. This is a really cool passage to take a look at. We've seen all this language of exile and of judgment, and here we have a good reminder of what God is doing. And what is amazing is we get to the end and God is doing an interesting thing, and, and we'll see what that is. But first, we need to remember this story that is told throughout Scripture, this idea of God redeeming a people for himself, of him making a people for himself, and it's all connected to his saving grace, to his redeeming power. And so we see here that Israel needs to remember and Jacob needs to remember. In other words, this all-encompassing, hey, all the people who are my people, you need to remember something very important. I formed you. You are my servant. Hey, you're mine. I have made you my servant. I have bought you. And that's why this redemption language is so important here. This idea that they've been redeemed, that they've been bought. God has taken possession of them. He, for lack of a better term, owns them because he has bought them. And so what was done to buy them? He's blotted out their transgressions like a cloud and their sins like a mist. And so he's calling them to return to him. Hey, I have set you free from sin. I have bought you from that. And so there is praise that is to be done. And we see this in verse 23. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. In other words, there's this idea of praise to God from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Everything, the, the mountains, the forests, everything is praising God. Why? It all goes back to this idea of redemption, of the sins being forgiven, of, of God buying his people back, of him bringing them to himself. And we see that this was what was going on all along, right? That this language here, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer who formed you from the womb. Uh, not only does that apply to you and I, that God forms us in the womb and he knows us and, and he knows that he is going to call us to himself from that point. 
but it also is, is imagery for the birthing of his people as a whole, that he knew who they were. He made them. He formed them from the beginning. Before they were a people, he knew they would be a people. And then we have this connection here with the creation of all things. And, and we've seen this throughout the book of Isaiah, haven't we? This idea of, of God being sovereign, not only of, of Israel, but of all of creation. And we're going to see some more of that further down here a little bit as well about the power of God over creation. But he says, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. He is the one who is doing all this. And if he can do that, then he can bring us to himself. He can redeem us. He can save us. He can forgive our sins. He can do all of these things because he has this power. He is more than the gods of their neighbors. He is the one true God, the God who is over all things, the God who has made all things. And so we get some ideas here of what is happening, that the people are coming back, that Jerusalem is going to be restored, that the temple will be rebuilt. And God uses this, this idea of his power over all things by talking about things in creation, right? Uh, we see at the end of verse 26, she shall be inhabited in the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up the ruins. God's saying that he's going to do this. But who is it that's saying this? It's the one who says to the deep, be dry and I'll dry up the rivers. God has that power. They have seen the miracles in the stories of their people who have come before when, when God dried up the Jordan River, right? And, and he made it so that they could walk across on dry land. There's this imagery of God having power over something that we can't even fathom. To, to make a river dry is unfathomable to us, but God has the power to do it. So if God can do that miracle, he also has the power to say to Cyrus, hey, this pagan king, he is my shepherd, and he's going to do my purposes. God has power over that. Even this pagan king is going to do something, and, and what is Cyrus going to do? He is going to tell them to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. God is doing a miracle here. It is an amazing thing. God does this purpose through even a pagan king. How amazing is that? But because we know that he is God over all things, we understand that he is able to do this. And so as we look at this passage, we are reminded of what we're always reminded of, that there's this deep connection between the salvation of the, the salvation that God gives us and then our servanthood to him. And we understand that he is the only one that can do this. He's the only one with power over this. He's the only one who can buy us back because, well, he's the one we've offended in our sin. So may we remember this power that God has. And may we remember that he has taken this power that he has and he has used it to redeem us, to buy us back, to make us his servants. In Christ, we have that freedom and we are a part of that people that God has known and has formed from the womb. We are the people of God. And so may we be his faithful servants today and every day. And may we spread this good news that others might hear and believe. Let's close up with a word of prayer. Gracious God, through your word and spirit today, make us mindful that we are your servants. This is not because of anything that we've done, but because you have blotted out our transgressions like a cloud and our sins like a mist. Grant that we would daily return to you, for you alone are the one who has redeemed us. And may we sing praise to you for what you have done. From the highest heavens to the depths of the earth, you are to be praised. For the Lord has redeemed a people for himself and is glorified among his people. And we bring our prayers once again to you for the persecuted church. We lift up our brothers and our sisters, and we ask for your hand of protection to be upon them. Bless them with safety as they worship you in spirit and in truth. We also pray that you would protect them as they share the gospel. Give them a boldness to proclaim the good news of Christ and him crucified. And we pray that you would bring many to faith as your children witness to who you are and your power to save a people for yourself. And so we submit our day to you, and we know that your sovereign hand is upon us for our good and your glory. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, hope you have a great Friday and a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.